153 of them. <laughs> Each time I hear or read the 21st chapter of John's Gospel, there's a detail about it that always bothers me. For some, this detail may be subtle, for others, quite obvious. But at this point in the Gospel, the risen Jesus has appeared to Mary Magdalene, who at first thinks he's the gardener. Then he appeared to the disciples without Thomas. Then he appeared again to the disciples with Thomas present. And it is Thomas who makes the ultimate, or perhaps penultimate, pronouncement of this gospel, my Lord and my God. It is true that the last verses of John chapter 20 seem an appropriate place to end the whole gospel. Indeed, a majority of scholars believe that the 21st chapter was an add-on, like an epilogue, written either by the evangelist himself or by another. But even the earliest manuscripts of the gospel include chapter 21. And the more I think about it, the more I think that chapter 21 was perhaps an original part of the gospel, even if we take it to be an epilogue. Now here's the detail that bothers me. The disciples are back home in Galilee, having returned from Jerusalem. And seven of them have returned to their old occupation of fishing. They are at the Sea of Tiberias, where they have always worked. They have gone back to what they were doing before Jesus ever came along. Having traveled all over the country with Jesus for the last three years, having gone to Jerusalem for the Passover and known of the crucifixion, having been in the upper room with the doors locked tighter than a drum, and having had the risen Jesus appear to them twice, having gone through all of that, they now go back to fishing. And they're not even fishing for people. They're fishing for fish. Why? Why did they go back to the old way of doing things? Why weren't they out sharing the good news of Jesus' resurrection? Why weren't they at least feeding the hungry or healing the sick? Why? I want to suggest two possible reasons in response to that question, which may also give us some insight into why chapter 21 was a part of the original gospel and teach us something about discipleship to boot. The first has to do with a very common human response when we've experienced something wonderful. We want to stay there. We want to hold on to that experience, whatever it is. We want it to last forever. Maybe you are thinking about watching a beautiful sunset with someone you love, or sailing out on the Pacific Ocean, or holding your newly born child for the first time and recognizing the miracle of life. This is heaven, you might say. I wish time could stop right now. I want it to be like this forever. Perhaps you even felt that way about Easter services here or elsewhere. We live through six weeks of solemnity in the church with no alleluias. We fast, we pray, we give alms, we sit in silence. We move through the services of Holy Week in darkness and pain, not to mention the two years of the pandemic. And then finally, at the great vigil, we walk into a dark church holding one small candle and hear our story, our own story, from the beginning of time. We baptize new Christians and welcome them into the community. And then the lights go up full and we realize that the church is filled with white lilies, a decorated altar, and the shroud on the cross is gone. It is gleaming bright. The altar guilds polished everything in sight. With joyful recognition, we shout, Alleluia, 
Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Why can't it always be like that? Why do we ever want to leave or change the pure joy that is experienced in community when we celebrate our Lord's resurrection? Stay with us, Lord. Keep it just this way. Stay here. That is, I think, where the disciples were. They had experienced the risen Jesus in a very real, tangible way. Why couldn't he just stay with them? Be on hand in case they needed help or advice. Stay nearby in case they had questions that needed answering or wounds that needed healing. They wanted him where they could learn and lean on him and follow his lead and altogether bask in his presence. They had a Lord they could see and hear and touch and they liked it that way. And wouldn't we like it too? Stay with us, Lord. But he will not stay. That is the truth of it. He will not stay put. Stay the same. Stay with us. Stay is our chorus, but his refrain is, follow. Follow me he says, over and over again, as he moves out into the world, broadcasting his Holy Spirit, blending into the crowd so well that if we choose to go after him, we much must search every face on the off chance that it might be his. In the Book of Common Prayer, we have a beautiful little prayer in the service of evening prayer that goes like this, and it's based on that appearance in Luke's Gospel to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our companion in the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope that we may know you as you are revealed in scripture and the breaking of the bread. Grant this for the sake of your love. Stay with us, we pray. And so Christ's presence is with us always. That is a comfort to be sure, but it is not a command or permission to stay put. Follow me says the risen Christ. Follow me out into the world so that together we may continue to show God's love to the world. Which brings me to the second possible reason the disciples returned to their old way of doing things instead of going out into the world. I confess that this is pure conjecture, but I do not think it's without warrant. I wonder, I wonder if they needed a little more love. I wonder if the disciples' love for Jesus was a little too shaky or perhaps immature. In some ways, their love for Jesus was not sufficient. Even after all the healings and miracles and resurrection to inspire them to plunge into the risky task of proclaiming God's love to the world and proclaiming God's redemption of the world. Perhaps this is what they and we need to learn from the gospel lesson this Sunday. Without love, the spirit does not come or we are not able to receive it. Before all gifts, before all miracles, before all signs and wonders comes love. The Apostle Paul was certainly lacking it. And the risen Christ's love and redemption for Paul was so great that years later, Paul would write, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Jesus' conversation with Peter certainly points us in this direction. Scholars will tell us that the three times Jesus asked the question of Peter is to balance out the three times Peter denied Jesus before his crucifixion. 
But Jesus' question could have been different. Jesus could have asked Peter, Simon, son of John, will you follow me? Or, Simon, son of John, will you continue my work in the world? Or, Simon, son of John, will you remember me? But the question, repeated three times, was, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Years ago, a Johns Hopkins professor at the university, not the hospital, gave a group of graduate students this assignment. Go to the slums, take 200 boys between the ages of 12 and 16 and investigate their background and environment. Then predict their chances for the future. The students, after consulting social statistics, talking to the boys and compiling much of the data, concluded that 90% of the boys from this ghetto would spend some time in jail. 25 years later, another group of graduate students was given the job of testing the, predict the prediction. They went back to the same area. Some of the boys, by then men, were still there. A few had died, some had moved away, but they got in touch with 180 of the original 200. They found that only four had spent some time in jail. Why was it that these men who had lived in a breeding place of crime had such a surprisingly good record? The researchers were continually told, well, there was this teacher. They pressed further and found that in 75% of the cases, it was the same woman. The researchers went to this teacher, now living in a retirement home. How had she exerted this remarkable influence over that group of children? Could she give them any reason why these boys should have remembered her? No, she said, no, I really couldn't. And then, thinking back over the years, she said musingly, more to herself than her questioners, how I loved those boys. In this morning's gospel lesson, after Peter proclaims his love for Jesus three times, and Jesus responds with the command, feed my sheep, Jesus can conclude that part of the conversation with a phrase he has used many times before, but now has new meaning for the disciples. Come, follow me, Jesus says. This time, they followed him to death because they understood the meaning of love. In the name of the risen Christ, Amen. Amen. Amen.